Hello everybody, so today I want to make a short video talking about the quality of lumber you can get uh, off of a home sawmill. And uh, this is motivated mainly by a couple comments I've seen on uh, my videos where people were either asking about the quality or some, some guy claimed, you know, you can't get good quality out of these mills. And I thought to myself, well, this is, this is you know, I don't, I don't even need to waste too much time talking about this or uh, writing about it. The, the proof you know, it was in the pudding. I can just show some of the lumber I've saw and then go over to the mill and talk about some of the issues and factors that kind of go into the quality of lumber. But uh, I thought I'd start up here. I'm up on a ladder and this is uh, uh, one of the beams on the timber frame carport project I'm looking, uh, working on right now. And, you know, you can, you can look. We got a nice clear view of the surface of that cut. Uh, this is what's coming off of my sawmill. It didn't take any extra effort to get it this smooth. I mean, you can see the saw marks, the blade marks, but uh, you know, they're very, very close together, very tight, uh, very small. And uh, uh, this is a really smooth piece of lumber for, for such a large beam. Um, and I think this is really representative of the quality you can get out of these sawmills. And so uh, I'm gonna move around and we'll go look at some other wood that's been sawn and, and talk a little bit more about this. All right, here's another view here. We're looking at a uh, two by four uh, purlin, and then we have some two by six rafters uh, over there. And, and uh, you can sort of sight down the edge of that purlin and see how nice and straight it is, how square the edges are, how crisp it is. I mean, that's a very nice quality piece of lumber. And then you can look over on the rafters and there's some more purlins up there and, you know, see the same thing. Uh, you can see the, the cut and, you know, you can see some saw marks here, but uh, it's all very smooth. I mean, there's nothing there that you can really even feel. It's more about what you can see than you can feel. Okay, and here we are looking at one of the posts. And uh, again, you know, that's a nice crisp edge. You can see very minimal saw marks, very smooth. Uh, just really nice uh, piece of lumber coming off the mill. Okay, finally, I'm, I'm over here at my sawmill. Right now, it's uh, kind of being used to store or stack up some oddball lumber I had. And uh, uh, we're looking at a big wide piece here. And this is, I call this a volunteer because I, I this was an extra when I was cutting two by fours to get it uh, squared up to the size I wanted. I ended up taking uh, this guy off in the middle. There's an even bigger one there. And uh, these will be great for shelving or something else, I think. But, you know, again, you, look, you can sight down that board and uh, look at the quality of the cut. That's a very smooth cut, very nice and straight. And uh, it's also very uniform thickness all the way down the, the length of the, of the board. So uh, I think this is representative of the, of the quality you can get with these, uh, you know, low end uh, home sawmills. And, and it really doesn't matter what the, the brand is as long as it's a pretty decent mill. Now, um, one thing I've seen mentioned in the comments is, is uh, talking about wavy cuts, and I thought I'd show an example of that. So here's a board, and if you look at that part of the board, you'll notice it's the cut's really wavy there. The quality's noticeably worse. And in fact, I'll come around here, and there's a real good view. The light is just right there. You can see it's really wavy up in this first part of the board. And uh, the other interesting thing, if you kind of can sight on these blade marks they go straight across the board but these waves are angled a little bit and that's a sure sign of chatter and the reason it's angled is when you get chatter uh, it means the blade is twisting and flexing and you combine that twisting flexing motion with the fact that you're pushing the sawmill you know this way and uh, it causes the blade to kind of just like wobble back and forth and you end up getting these wavy marks that are on an angle and uh, that's that's really not any indication that you got a lousy sawmill. That means you're doing something wrong. And uh, there are a couple things that can cause this. First of all, if you have a really dull blade and you have to push really hard, you can induce this problem, uh, you know, with any sawmill. Uh, second, if the board is not secured down well enough. Uh, and the board wants to move, it's going to induce that chatter and that wobble. And when I see it, I almost always see it on the ends of boards. 
uh, when I'm down to maybe the last cut out of a cant. And, you know, you might just have a one thin board down there and uh, it's, you, you have it clamped to your bed, of course, but the clamps are, you know, a couple feet down the board. And uh, the end of that board is just sitting on the bunks and it's really not secured too well. And so when you enter that board with the blade, you know, the board can move and that's going to induce that chatter and leave those marks. I found, I've had luck just putting like a brick on the end of the board to kind of, you know, keep it pressed down on the bunks and that seems to uh, eliminate that problem. Uh, but I think that's the most common and really the only time I see it now is when I'm going into the end of a very thin board for a final cut. And, and so, you know, that's more about holding the board secure. Uh, and I, I think really the last factor is going to be your blade guides. Whether or not they are able to keep that blade in check and prevent it from moving. Um, now, in this case, you know, I've got a HM122. I do not have the adjustable guides. Um, one of the benefits, if, I, if you had an adjustable guide, you could slide this one out and really keep that blade constrained if you're cutting a narrower log. Uh, that will really help uh, a lot with any chatter issues. But, you know, I've just showed you all those other pieces of wood I've cut without that adjustable blade guide, which means I got this full, basically 22 inch uh, blade just sitting out there. Um, and, you know, you saw I got very smooth lumber, uh, you know, except for that occasional chatter on the end of a thin board, I have very, very smooth cuts. And so um, an adjustable blade guide can help, but you know, my results show that it's not absolutely necessary if you got everything else uh, correct and you're doing everything else right. So, uh, you know, I want to come back to these guides, though. You know, it's important to have these set right. Uh, Woodland, use, Woodland Mills uses uh, fixed blade guides. They're just uh, hardened steel, basically a kind of a bushing that's uh, inside of a block and held in there with set screws. And you need to carefully set that gap between the bushing and the blade. They recommend a 20 thousandths of an inch gap. There's a couple ways you can set that. Um, what I found over the years, and this is just from being an engineer working in machine shops, if you got one of these old school metal rulers, these are almost always about 20 thousandths of an inch, or sometimes maybe 23, but uh, you know, you can shove one of these in between that block and the blade. If you got two rulers, hey, put one top and bottom pinch it with your fingers and tighten them down. That's gonna help you set the, the, uh, the clearance there. Another thing you can do is to buy some shim stock. And here's an example of a 20 thousandths shim stock. Uh, Starrett makes these. Um, any really machine shop supply company is gonna have these in different thicknesses. I think I got this one on Amazon for about two bucks. So, you know, get two of these. Put one on top of the blade, put one on the bottom of the blade between the blade and those blocks, pinch it with your fingers and then tighten down those set screws. Now at the rear of the blade, there's an actual roller bearing back there and they want 40 thousandths clearance there. And so you could either get a 40 thousandths piece of shim stock, uh, you could stack two of these 20s together to make 40 thousandths, or what I found that uh, works in a lot of great cases is, you know, Go get a hacksaw blade. These are almost always, well, it depends on the, the blade and the, you know, the tooth pitch and all that, but these are almost always about 40 thousandths. You could use this, put this behind the blade, between the, the blade and that roller bearing, and set your depth there. And so those are a couple ways you can set those, uh, those guide blocks. Um, these screws need to be snug down real, real tight. I think I spent the first third of my life over tightening fasteners and then the second third uh, being scared to tighten fasteners. And I'm, uh, I'm kind of back into a zone now where I take it, play it by ear, but uh, these guys need to be snugged up pretty much as tight as you can make them to hold those blocks in place. Uh, when you do that, you know, I haven't adjusted these blocks for a couple months and I've gone through a couple blade changes and uh, I checked the clearance and it's still good. So. Uh, you know, once you set it, get those snugged up tight, that those, those guide blocks uh, should be good uh, for, for a long, long time. And, and when those are set properly, those are going to help constrain that blade from wobbling 
uh, basically it's going to limit you to 20 thousandths you know up or down uh, under nominal use they should there should be no movement at all and those blocks really shouldn't be touching but if you get into that wobble situation you know that's what's going to keep you from you know getting into a really big problem and so it's good to have those guide blocks adjusted the uh, last thing I want to mention you know some people don't like these types of guide blocks they'd rather have roller bearings uh, I've seen some people you know ding woodland mills for not having roller bearings uh, you know they do have one on the rear again back here to support the rear of the blade uh, but these are fixed bushings uh, me personally I don't think it matters if you know if you're cutting with a sharp blade if you're doing things right if you're not pushing too hard if you got your wood secured down if you got your guide set right you really shouldn't need to support that blade too much at all and uh, to me it doesn't matter if it's blocks or rollers but if you really think rollers are better uh, I think Cook Sawmills and a couple other companies sell roller guides they're very inexpensive like I'm talking like you know 50 60 bucks that you can easily retrofit to woodland mills uh, so if you're really hung up on the idea of roller guides hey go for it put them on your mill and that'll eliminate any you know concerns or doubts you might have now the the the, the, the last thing i want to talk about is really cost of the mill and and what you get uh, you know this mill the hm 122 nine and a half horse um, with options and shipping this was under four thousand dollars that's very inexpensive for a sawmill uh, other mills i've used in the past cost as much as forty thousand dollars i mean that's a big difference factor of 10 and um i think a lot of people are doubtful that a four thousand dollar sawmill can cut well but you know again look at all the wood i showed you today i think that's excellent cut quality the primary thing you're going to get with a more expensive mill is going to be productivity features and ease of use features, but it's not going to really improve the cut quality. And that's important to realize, you know, money, big money doesn't improve cut quality. And in fact, I've seen homemade bandsaw mills that are running on, you know, tractor tires that can produce some amazing cut quality. And so clearly money doesn't really factor into that you know so I, I think it's important to point out you can get a four thousand dollar mill um if it's a good mill it, it doesn't matter the brand if it's a good mill that and they've worked out the basics with you know good wheels good tracking adjustment uh good mechanical design it's fully capable of giving you a high quality cut and uh, it's going to be as good as the cut you're going to get on a forty thousand dollar mill the main thing you're going to get out of those more expensive mills are features like log handling, hydraulics, power feed, computerized control, uh, things like that. And uh, sure, I'd love to have some of that stuff, but uh, if you're a hobbyist, if you're just sawing lumber for your own projects, if you enjoy sawing lumber and you're not in a big hurry, you don't need to crank out a thousand boards, hey, you know, these manual push mills do a great job, and um, I don't think there's anything wrong with going with one of these uh, entry-level types of mills in those scenarios. So uh, that's all about all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, thanks for watching. So here's some uh, bonus footage for people who appreciate good lumber. I just cut this 2x4. This is a 10 foot long after I cut it. Uh, incidentally, if you try to buy this in the store around here, it's going to be, uh, I think, 11 or $12, which is ridiculous. But uh, one thing that jumped out at me is look at all those rings on the end. I counted 12 rings across that board when you go up into the corners. Uh, you look at a typical store-bought 2x4, you'd be lucky if you see four or five rings in those guys. So just amazing quality. This is the kind of lumber you can produce at home with your low-cost sawmill.